Nicole, thank you very much. Um, we'll uh, keep that open, as usual. Um, just uh, say hello to someone uh, next to you. If you haven't yet said hello to the person next to you, do say hello to them, just for 30 seconds, while I get myself ready. Good. Time's up. <clears throat> I just had to move the height of the music stand. That's why I did that. Um, there was a church that did a series of um, uh, sermons on these psalms, and they called the series Songs from the 70s, um, which I thought was quite a good title for a series in this book of psalms. Um, they are songs. Um, we've been going through uh, the 73, 4, 5, and we'll do 6, and... Uh, come to 77, I think, after that. Um, and there's a, a bit of a theme through them, the theme of God's judgment. Um, the title um, that we gave for this evening is Declaration. I think um, another title might be something like The Comfort of God's Judgment, which sounds a very strange thing to say. That's a bit like saying that the sweetness of salt or um, the lightness of night time. Um, but I think the comfort of judgment is something of what these psalms are about um, together. Um, let me pray that as we look, we learn much tonight. I think we need to pray for um, humility tonight, especially because it's uh, an extraordinary message, really. Let's um, ask for God's help to hear it as he intends it to be heard. Father, thank you for uh, your greatness and your goodness, as we've sung already. Thank you that you are uh, the sovereign Lord, the one who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we pray that as we hear you now, we bring our lives and our hearts into line with your word. And we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Um, last week, um, we began the sermon on Psalm 74 um, by thinking about that terrible shooting in Charleston, um, Carolina, in the United States. And I remember thinking um, that if I used that illustration then, I can't really use it the following week. Um, and assuming that there won't be anything else quite so terrible in the intervening period, was I sure that I didn't want to save up the Charleston event for tonight? It seems from this past week I needn't have worried um, on that score, um, whether a church in America or a beach in Tunisia, the horrors that we've been thinking about are not going to become less frequent any time soon. Um, one of the purposes, as I was suggesting, of these psalms, I think, is to bring reassurance and comfort to the people of God, especially in the midst of terrible evil and wickedness in a world around them, much as we experience today. Um, the idea of God judging the world just in general is rather quaint, isn't it, in some people's thinking. I think the image is of the, the sandwich board wearer strolling up and down a high street with the words, the end is nigh, written on the front and the back. And it causes people to rather laugh and mock um, rather than fear and tremble. Um, as we go through the psalm, one thing is clear, and that is that Judgment is a certainty. It is absolutely definite. Here's a first heading for tonight. God's judgment is set out. It's going to happen. The plans for it are laid. It's definitely going to happen. If you look at verse 2 in our psalm, the writer is speaking to God and he says, You say, I choose the appointed time. It is I who judge uprightly. God does have a plan to judge the world. It's in his diary. Uh, he hasn't arranged that day in liaison with everyone to see when we can all manage. He has decided that day himself. It's a day of his choosing, verse 2. I choose the appointed time. So the timing is set. I choose the appointed time, says God. The, the judge himself is set. Uh, it is I, God says, who will judge and the word judge really means to put right. It's a great cosmic sorting out of everything that's not right. And the terms of the judgment are set out. He's going to judge how uprightly. 
Um, So this sorting out is going to be entirely fair and just. No one is going to be the, the victim of a terrible miscarriage of justice. There'll be no wrong decisions. There'll be no sort of fat cat lawyers pressing for a particular verdict to get their money. And then when the world and your life seem like they can't get any worse, I guess we may have felt that this week. Verse 3, remember it's God who's holding it all together. Verse 3, when the earth and all its people quake, it is I, says God, who holds its pillars firm. So a week like this week, the earth is creaking under the stress and the strain of endless disasters and struggles and conflicts and crises. The only reason it doesn't get even worse than this last week is because God is holding the pillars firm. Um, I don't think we think really of the earth as a a, a building with pillars, but that's the the image we have here. Um, The earthquake comes, if you can imagine it. God is still there, his hands on the pillars, keeping the whole structure from total collapse. Perhaps in an individual's life, uh, things feel like they're at a breaking point. God is the reason they're not even worse than they may be. So um, when we die, uh, we don't just get buried. We don't just get cremated and hope to end up in a good place eventually. God says here that a judgment is actually set. Man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment. Now because of that, verse 4, God says to the arrogant people of the world, boast no more. To the arrogant, I say, boast no more, and to the wicked, do not lift up your horns. That's God's message to the people of the world. If there is a day in the dire, it's going to happen. The application is stop boasting as if you run your world yourself. So stop speaking and living as if you're the masters of your own destiny. Don't lift up your horns, it says here. The horn in the Bible is often a symbol for power and strength. You uh, might imagine a goat with a horn, and he gets a bit edgy with his fellow goats and starts butting the other goats to get control again. Um, I like the idea in the animal world of the sort of pompous boasting of a peacock um, strutting around some farmyard, farm yard, perhaps wobbling along like a normal bird, but then suddenly it arches up and all its feathers parade around pompously, arrogantly, boastfully. And in the hearts of people... That's the attitude which they have against God. So in verse 5, God says, Don't lift your horns against heaven. Don't speak, he says, with outstretched neck. It's always interesting to see where current English phrases in our language come from Bible verses. We have um, phrases like, In the twinkling of an eye, which comes from 1 Corinthians. We have... Uh, That time when we say a leopard can't change its spots because someone's so set in their ways comes from Jeremiah. I wonder if you think of the the time when we tell people to to wind their neck in a bit, as in get back in your place, back down. Perhaps that comes from verse 5 here. Do not speak with outstretched neck. I think as you listen to conversations around the place nowadays, it is often unpleasantly flavoured with... Uh, an arrogance and a boasting, just on a sort of assumption that we are in charge. And who is God to make a difference to my life? Uh, someone might say, well, I, I, I don't think I'm too bad. Or, uh, I'm sorry, but I just can't accept that, that you say the Bible says. Or it may be an innocent sort of plan for the future, which sounds sort of fine. But uh, there's a person thinking, well, what we'll do is we'll work to this stage and then we'll plan this, then we'll set up our own business, then we'll retire, and that's how we'll run our life. And there's no consideration at all for the God who's made you and owns you. I am my own master. It's the sort of mantra. God says, don't speak with an outstretched neck because judgment is set to happen. It's definitely going to be. I wonder actually if um, many people do have a hunch that there's going to be a day of reckoning of some kind. You sort of feel there ought to be, even if you don't want to think about yourself being there very much. Uh, But that even if it does happen, perhaps people wonder, is it really going to be that bad? Uh, Nowadays, criminals seem to get off lightly sometimes. There's always... um, There's always bail, there's restricted sentences and things like that. There's early release for good behaviour. 
Is the judgment of a loving God really going to be that bad? What does the psalm say about that sort of question? What judgment is going to be like? Well, the verses 6 to 8, I'm saying, is God's anger being poured out. That's what judgment is going to be like. It's quite hard working out the original kind of setting for the, the psalm. You know, what, what's the historical event that sparked it? But it might be that there are enemies of the people of God and uh, they're threatening to attack from the north, perhaps. Okay, verse 6 is a reminder to the people that there's no help going to be forthcoming from anywhere else in the world, either east, west, or from the desert in the south. Um, verse 7, no one can truly exalt anyone else, raise them up. Uh, except God alone. It is God who judges. He brings one down and exalts another. God and only God will bring one person low and another person up. And verse 8 is very uh, sobering, isn't it? Judgment is not going to be some inconsequential court hearing where punishment will be entirely bearable and uh, possibly shortened if we seem sorry. Judgment's going to involve God pouring out his anger or his wrath. Verse 8. In the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. Uh, We're familiar with cups. Uh, We'll be holding one perhaps in about 20 minutes' time. Uh, A cup is something you drink from. Drinking is a pleasant thing. Uh, You drink from cups at perhaps a social occasion, a pleasant scene. Uh, Cups are are nice things. They're good. Uh, Cups in the Bible come in lots of different places, um, but it seems that the usual appearance of a cup in the Bible is of a rather dreaded vessel to hold things. And to drink the contents of the dreaded vessel is to take God's fair anger at sin and idolatry. It is the cup of God's wrath. Uh, In uh, the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah, they talk about this cup a couple of times. And uh, as they write, those who receive this kind of cup are described in frightening Ways Those who drink it are pictured as staggering around, going mad, fainting, and vomiting. So don't think nice drink of something. Think horrific chalice of poisonous filth. The spices are to make it a really potent mix. And in verse 8, God pours it out. It's a cup that is in his hand. And if you imagine, he puts it to the lips of the wicked and he makes them drink. And all the wicked of the earth will have to drink it. You cannot say, no, I won't, thanks, because I'm driving. And all of them will drink all of it down to the dregs. So it's not like accidentally tasting some rancid milk which you can spit out. You drink it all and God will make sure that it is all drunk. That is judgment day for the wicked. Now here, the wicked, I think first and foremost, are the surrounding countries around the people of God, Israel. And it shows just what a very dangerous thing it is to attack or to harm or to speak against God's people. It was a serious mistake then. It's a very serious mistake today. The thing is, we just don't see yet how serious it is. But we can rest assured that to attack Christians whether it's ISIS in Cobain in Iraq or whether it's social exclusion at a party in Bournemouth, whatever it is, if they don't turn to Christ, they will face God's anger poured out, as this psalm describes. Before we get too smug, no one, of course, lives in the world as they should. No one inclines to live the right way before God. You and I, without Christ, we also are wicked. Uh, not uh, headline criminals that would be on the BBC website or whatever it is, but we are boastful self-promoters in our heart. We are glory stealers from God. We are mini-masters of our own universes. 
And Christians, therefore, are only too aware of our tendency to be like that, only too aware of our need of the Lord Jesus. Um, Jesus talks about this same cup. You may remember from Easter time, we go through the events of Easter, and Jesus, when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, um, he prays, and one of his prayers asks his heavenly Father that if possible, this cup be taken from him. Uh, What's he talking about? He's talking about the cross that is about to happen around the corner. He knows that the cross for him is the drinking down God's wrath to the very dregs. He would bear on himself all of God's anger at sin. There is this cup that Jesus endures, the cup of God's anger poured out. Uh, Psalm 23 is another of the psalms that we've looked at in these evenings, perhaps the most famous psalm um, in the Bible. And uh, you may remember in the second half of that psalm, there is mention of another cup. Um, It's what we might call the cup that um, the believer can enjoy. It's a cup, if you remember, which overflows because of the abundance of God's hospitality for those who are his people, those who've admitted that they're self-promoting boasters and who've come to Christ and asked him to drink the cup of God's wrath on their behalf. For those people, there's this wonderful cup of abundance, the blessing of being in in God's presence. And it puts um, the decision for every person very clearly and starkly. Um, Which cup are you going to drink? If I can put it like that. Um, If you're not yet a Christian, that is the question for you. Which cup are you going to drink? Many people are thinking about the Christian faith. Um, Some here, um, some have been thinking about it for some time. Uh, Some have been thinking about it for enough time. And uh, that is the question to think about. It's strange, isn't it? You go to a, a bar on a Saturday night, your friends will ask you, what are you drinking? Come to church on a Sunday night and God is asking you, what are you drinking? Which cup are you going to be drinking from? Are you going to be drinking the cup of God's anger? Or will you admit your pride and boasting and ask Jesus to do that for you? So that you can enjoy a cup of overflowing abundance in the hospitality and party which God has for his people. If you're not a Christian, that's the question for you. Which cup are you going to end up drinking God's judgment is set out. It's going to happen, no question. God's anger will be poured out. That's what it will involve. And just as the psalm finishes, God's deeds then are to be spoken out. Uh, Let's look at the last couple of verses. Verse 9. This seems to be the, uh, the writer of the psalm. As for me, he says, I will declare this forever. I will sing praise to the God of Jacob. And verse 10 perhaps is slightly tricky because it's not exactly clear who is saying verse 10. It could be the writer of the psalm still and he's sort of pledging to work in accordance with the judgment that's to come. He'll do what he can to restrain the wicked. I wonder if more likely it returns to God speaking as he has been earlier in the psalm. So earlier God told the wicked not to lift up their horns against heaven and at the end here he's saying, look, I will cut you off if you don't stop lifting up your horns. He really will judge them. He really will pour out his anger. And the comfort for God's people right at the end is that they really will be lifted up. They will be exalted. Now, I think for many hearers of the psalm, judgment doesn't sit very easily, does it, with us? Um, We don't have to be... Uh, not a Christian for that to happen. We can be a Christian and sit here and think it doesn't really fit well with us. And in particular because of, if you like, the beginning and the end of the psalm. It's a rather awkward sandwich, this psalm. In the middle, verses 2 to 8, there is this large slab of judgment. But the bread is very strange. Uh, the bread at the beginning is, do you see verse 1? What is the bread? It's It's weird thanksgiving the bread at the end verse 9 is declaration and praise can it really be right that um, God's deeds of judgment are to be spoken out with praise and thanksgiving 
makes one feel rather uncomfortable. Although it would make sense, wouldn't it, if the judgment is to be declared to God's people. If this is the believer being reminded, the suffering believer, the one who's at the hands of the wicked having a terrible time, how good to know that judgment is coming. Thank God that justice will be seen to be prevailing one day. Thank you that vindication will come for those who are getting it in the neck for being believers. Um, Just look to the end of Psalm 74 last week. um, Verse 22 of Psalm 74. Rise up, O God, was the prayer. Defend your cause. Remember how fools mock you all day long. It's not just that the wicked are doing better than God's people. That was Psalm 73. It's that the wicked are doing bad things to God's people, Psalm 74. And so for the enemies of God's people to be brought to justice, what a relief. How good that God's judgment is set out to happen. There are still believers across the world, we thought about them last week, getting in in the neck, to put it mildly, facing exclusion, facing torture, death for being a Christian. It was good that we prayed for them earlier as Henry led us. And we can look on, can't we, and feel rather helpless. What on earth do I say? What if I met a believer from Iraq tomorrow? What would I say to them? Or even in this country, there are those, aren't there, who face real hardships for being Christians at the hands of family or colleagues who mock them. What should we be saying to them? Well, doesn't Psalm 75 say there's a place perhaps to speak up to fellow believers about judgment? Is there not a place for saying to a fellow Christian, be assured because God has chosen the appointed time? At the right time, there may be something to say to another Christian to comfort them. You might say, well, look, don't worry, in the hand of the Lord is a cup. He's going to pour it out. Thank God there is judgment set to happen. It's to be spoken out to one another. But I guess as we read verse 9, we look at the word declare and we think most immediately of declaring to the world around us. And that is, of course, true too. We must declare to the world around us that there is judgment. Um, On Friday morning, I was um, writing this up in the final flurries of sermon preparation, and I went for a a walk to the clifftop, um, just as a mental rest, and it was a a really, really beautiful day. You remember remember Friday? A long time ago now, but Friday was a lovely day. It was very sunny, and uh, I was uh, just standing on the clifftop. I looked out at the beach. It had just been combed by the tractors, you know what they're they're combing, and um, there was a, a lovely rose just in front of me. Even the bumblebees seemed friendly. It was such a, a lovely view. And then I thought, oh my goodness, I'm in the middle of preparing a, s- a sermon on Psalm 75, which is about judgment. And it just doesn't compute, does it? That there is a judgment, and we live in a lovely, lovely place, and the sun shines, it's all glorious, life is okay. God's judgment doesn't fit into that. The message about it is very unpopular. The message is unimaginable. We can't conceive of what it'll be like. It sounds unkind to talk about it. It doesn't promise anything for life now. It's not exciting. It's not fizzy. It's not dynamic. The message is given up on by many churches. So they won't talk about it anymore because it's too offensive. Certainly in our own denomination, the Church of England, you won't hear it much, if at all. About 10 years ago, there was an atheist journalist, apparently, who was discussing why churches are emptying. It's a good thing to discuss if you get an answer. Why such a depletion of numbers across the country? And his theory was that it was because churches have refused for so long now to preach the message of judgment. He said, what's the point of going if there's nothing to worry about? Interesting remark. Maybe there's something in it. You see, it is no good for us simply to say that Christianity will mean a better life. Because life in Bournemouth is already pretty good for so many. And anyway, what the Bible means by better is not what the world means by better. But in that sense, we we cannot compete with what this life offers. The gospel doesn't try to. The gospel 
is less a message about life improvement, it is more a message of death preparation. I'm not saying, don't hear me wrong, there is nothing to being a Christian now. Of course there is. Where would we be without the assurance of forgiveness? Where would we be without purpose in life? Where would we be without the transforming power of the Holy Spirit? But all of that is nothing if we are not with our holy and merciful Father when heaven begins. Of course we enjoy the blessings of beaches and bumblebees and sunny days. But all the time, I take it, we know in our hearts that Westbourne and Bournemouth and the UK, the world, needs to hear about judgment. That deed of God, verse 1, must be declared. Not carelessly or dispassionately, carefully and lovingly. Because Jesus has done all that is necessary to avoid it. Let's pray we'd hold to the message we've been given. Let's pray. We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks for your name is near. Men tell of your wonderful deeds. Confess, Heavenly Father, that on first reading this uh, is a strange mix, wonderful deeds and thanks with all that is to come with your anger being poured out. We pray you'd help us to align those two things and to see the goodness of a day when you will bring justice to the world and you will show evil up for being the evil that it is. Help us please to encourage and to declare this truth to one another and help us too to declare it to the world and to do that with large hearts for people with longing that they turn to Christ who has taken everything and we pray you'd help us in Jesus name. Amen.